They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. So before our drivetrain goes in the 69 Dodge Charger RTSC, now keep in mind, this is a very rare car. This is a T5 Copper. 440, four speed, 69 Charger RT, and it's a special edition. Not every car that comes through here is numbers matching. I just wanted to take a few minutes and show you what I mean, what the world means, when they talk about numbers matching. The biggest and the most important thing is the vehicle identification number. That the engine has the vehicle identification number stamped into it that the factory did when it was installed in the car. Same thing with the transmission. When you look at it, you just think it's beautiful. But I want to show that not only are the pieces that are on it beautiful, but they're correct for the year, make, and model. So starting at the front of the engine with the clutch fan. Now this is a replica of the original clutch fan. We get it from Tony over Tony's Mopar. It has the part number and the date code of when it was assembled. So in this case, H1I. That means it was August 1st, 1968. And our car was built in November of 1968. So that's the perfect date code. Our fan is also a replica. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a Pentastar on there stamped into it. That's because these are licensed. Tony, again, he makes these, Tony's Mopar. That Pentastar represents that it's a licensed product. After that, we have the part number. So we could put any fan belt on here, but these are actual replicas of the original V belt with the part number in it. On the lower radiator hose, you'll see that it has the part number stamped into it. That is a replica hose, it's not a 50 year old hose. The texture on the hose is exact to the originals. And you'll see that we're using the Corbin clamp as the original ones did to hold it in place. The spark plug wires, we get those from Classic Industries. They are date coded correct replicas. They have the right boot on them, the right part number on them, the right date code, and the right color of yellow ink stamped onto them. Even though the engines get painted and a lot of detail gets lost at that time, we still, in the beginning, do it right. Take a look at the Highland cylinder head bolts. These are the factory correct original bolts. If you don't have the H in there, they're not original to the car. Our exhaust manifolds are factory. The part number is cast into them. The Pentastar is cast into them. The date code is cast into them. These exhaust manifolds are original to the car. The upper radiator hose, just like the lower one, has the part number on it, as well as the Corbin clamp. Now the fuel lines, this gets a 3 8 delivery line. These are replicas of the original fuel line with the KV marking stamped on them. And they have the original Autoker clamps. The line that goes from the fuel pump to the separator is 5 16 of an inch, but it also has the KV markings and the Autoker clamps. Heater hoses also have the exact same number of ribs in them that the factory did, as well as the part number and the vendor code. Right-hand exhaust manifold, just like the left hand did, is factory. It has the original casting date, Pentastar, and date code. Again, very important detail here, the original spark plug wire separator brackets. The biggest part of this whole thing is the vehicle identification number. It's located on the right-hand side of the block down near the rail of the pan. In this case, that number matches the dash vehicle identification number. The hidden VIN on the core support, trunk lip, and the data plate. Same thing on the transmission. It matches the trunk lip hidden numbers, core support numbers, dash VIN, and data plate. The carburetor is the original numbers correct carburetor and date code for this car, as well as the bolts that hold it in place. Again, these are the Highland bolts. So in total, when you look at everything as a unit, it is exactly the way it appeared on the assembly line on the day the car was built. 
Today is a wonderful day. This is the first time in the history of graveyard cars we have a 1969 Barracuda. It is a 383 four-speed. That means it's an A57 Cuda. Now, the first time the word Cuda was ever used officially by Plymouth was on this model. Even though people with 65 to 69s all the time call them Cudas because it's a cute contraction of the word, it wasn't an official model until 1969, and that was in the mid-year. 1969. In the world of A-bodies, this little car is very collectible. They made a coupe version. This is the fastback style. So it looks like it's going 100 miles an hour sitting still. So we got this really cool Cuda. We don't get very many of these A-bodies in here. In this particular circumstance, this car did need a lot of work. It had a lot of rust on it and a lot of damage, so we ended up replacing quarter panels. The front inner fenders had been cut out for fender well exit headers. The old street rotters will know what that is. Well, we replaced those. The owner actually supplied us with a used front clip that we were able to put on. In addition, we replaced the main floor, the rear foot wells, the under seat pan, the spare tire well, trunk floor extensions, rear body panel, and both quarter panels. But the rest of the sheet metal on the car is original to it. So after the metal work's all done, they can start their body work. Once they've got the body work done, it'll come over to me, prime it, goes back to them. We'll do that a couple of times, so it actually gets primed three times. So when that car comes over to us, we long block the whole thing, check the edges, check the gaps, wash it, put it in the booth. Then at that point, we're ready to do our pre-paint. Look for any imperfections, kind of the same process that we've done before, just making sure the car's perfect, which it will be. Wrapped up our 1969 Cuda yesterday. Car came out amazing. It's the last car that we're gonna do a pre-paint on. We're actually building a team here. We have good helpers, other painters, and we can spend more time on the process. So when it comes time to paint it, it's a one and done deal. Today, Royal and I are gonna install the drivetrain in the 69 Charger. I'm helping Doug put the rear end in the 69 Root Beer Brown Charger. Got a four speed and all that good stuff, so uh, this should be fun today working with Royal. I'm not sure if Root Beer Brown is the correct color, but I'm sure Mark will correct me on it. Here's the thing about Royal I've noticed over the years. He called my Charger Root Beer Brown. It's FK5, and it was called Burnt Orange. He'd say, it's a Root Beer Brown. It's not Root Beer Brown, man. It's Burnt Orange. Use the correct terminology, right? This car is not Root Beer Brown. That is a completely different color. And that, it's not Root Beer. But what does he know? He's colorblind. Should be a pretty nice, straightforward install. He thought my coronet was yellow when I brought it, and I, I said, no, it's green. That is absurd. OK, first off, for the record, I know the difference between dog dung green, which is what his car is, and my car. I know it's not yellow. I know it's dog dung. I just have to say, hey, when was the last time I stepped in a pile of Royals Cornet? Right? And that's how I, a little mental thing for me, because I am colorblind. On another note, more importantly, the story he's talking about never happened to him. It was my story. I went up to Portland because there was a Superbird up there for sale. And I was so excited. And when we were in there getting ready to sign the papers on it, I had Suzanne with me. I said, I'm so excited. You know, I'm, this is great. I, I, I never even looked at the fender tag. I was so thrilled. I know that sounds really weird. And if I did, I didn't pay attention. I thought it was yellow. I like get my greens and yellows mixed up. Not dog dung green like Royal's car, GG1, which is like poo poo one, is what that code means. This particular case, I got it mixed up between FY1 and FJ5. So get your stories right, Royal. Pull them down. Royal's all business when it comes to mechanics. You know, he, he likes to just jump in there, plug away, and get this done. Right there, right there. Roll Ready? forward. You okay, Royal? Almost. Oh, no. All right. Right there. Come on, hang on. Don't move. Mark's a lot different. He likes to just clown around all the time and tell jokes and distract us, you know. So uh, it's fun working with Royal because he's all business. We've already got a little grease on there. We're going to pop that in there. A little grease on here. Oh, that was not bad, huh? No. OK, we're going to lower the shocks down. Can you grease that one? Oh, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. It won't reach. We are doing the final paint on our 1969 Barracuda going B5 blue. Now we've had a run of blue cars, so it's not that exciting, but what is exciting 
is we haven't done one of these cars before. Our 1969 Cuda, this is a beautiful little car, or it will be when we're finished with it. You pack that little 383 Super Commando in there and back it up with a four speed, eight and three quarter rear end with the 323 Sure Grip, and you've got a go fast little A body. Once I got the pre-paint wrapped up, initially let it sit for about a week, run a couple bake cycles on it. At that point, we tear the car apart, I'll panel paint it, jam it, get all that stuff done. So at that point, we can bolt the whole car back together, block it down one last time, and it's ready for final paint. And when you do that final paint, the car's blue and there's no issues. So we're doing the final paint, get that all wrapped up, do the blackouts that go on the rockers on this car, get it over to assembly, get the car underneath its own suspension, bring it back to me, then it gets these great stripes that go across the hood onto the header panel, drop those on last minute, put this car together and get it out of here. We've done pre-paints for years. We have historically pre-painted everything. That means painted it completely, put it together, and then walked around it, looked for any imperfections, sanded them out, made sure the style lines intersect, make sure the door gaps and everything are perfect on it, and then long block it out with 600, 400, 600 grit, and then walk around it one more time for paint. Mark's always been a big fan of doing the pre-paints. It's just because it allows you to cut some corners. Maybe when you have a car that's all blocked out and you see a little wave or something looks off a little bit, we're pre-painting the car. So you get that done and you can look at it and say, oh God, you don't see that at all. So it allows you some flexibility in the process. There's nothing wrong with that, but it gets expensive when you're doing it on as many cars as we have here. That's a lot of material. Nine times out of 10, the car looks great, which does speed the process up for final paint because you're not painting over gray. You're going blue over blue, so you don't have to do as many coats. So I decided that what we're gonna do is take more time prepping the car and really being careful. We got the right team. We haven't had that in the past. So moving forward, I think big picture wise, it's really gonna speed things up. We have more helpers now. I have more help over here. We have the right body men, the right painters, the right primer guys, the right metal guys, the right mud guys. So you're able to really just slow down a little bit, make sure a car is perfect when it's all in primer. Now we can make this look like it's had its pre-paint on it before we ever spray the first ounce of color. Roll it into the booth one time, get it painted, get it cut and buffed, and get it out of here. And because of that, I think it's going to increase our productivity as well as the quality of the finished product. I think everyone's gonna win in the long run. Let's get the other one loose. The shocks are hydraulic, and when you cut the wire tie, they extend, but they don't extend far enough. So we'll have to get a pogo. And so what we have to do is put a pogo under one side and raise one side of the rear end up so that we can install the shock. Here we go, yo. Right? Go, yo. Here go, we go. Yo. If you lift both sides of the car, it lifts it right off the hoist, so. Got it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Round three. Dinner bell. <laughs> Every time the bell rings, an idiot tells a joke. All right. Chromium? Hi, buddy. Nice to see you. Gym? Glad you could still work a half an hour a day. Royal? Yeah. Just thinking about you the other day. You know how much nicer it is working on a hoist? Yes, I do. You remember the good days? Good old days. In my carport, and pulling the transmission out. I had it stacked up on all kinds of stuff, remember? It didn't have any blocks. You know, we didn't have a lift as kids. We had to do everything on jack stands or pieces of wood or bricks or whatever we could find. So I, ha I think I stacked it on pool balls until <laughs> <laughs> it was a mile in the air. This is true. You guys are ready to put a front end in or are you just going to I think all so. Day? All right, let's put this bad mother in there. Let's line this thing up. You put that carburetor stud right in the middle of the tunnel. Hang on there. At Eagle Eye? I think it needs uh, just a touch that away, like that. OK, there we go. It's looking close. All right, I'll let you two guys with good eyes <laughs> do good that. Eyes. You ready to lower this bad boy down? Yeah, do you want to lower it? I can't do it with this. I can go pro I can do it. It's I running, so I like to make love to it. When they say make love to the camera, you caress the camera with your eyes. You make it one with you. So. Looks really good with that grease spot in your hair. You're talking about hair? Well, no, I just the grease. Get over there. You know, I don't know what Royal's talking about when it comes to hair. There's a picture of him at one year old, when usually your hair is really starting to come in at one year old, bald. 
He is leaving this earth the same way he came into it. Bald as an eagle. Got no room to talk about my hair. I'm honest. <clears throat> you guys just bring Put out the head, worst bro. in me. I still have some. I can comb it. It's a little wispy when it gets long, but it's there. Okay. Here we go. Do I need to go side to side? Nah, I think you're. Watch the passenger side. Oh, that doesn't look good there. It's going to come right down on top of that. The dip tube was hanging out underneath the frame rail. On certain years, the dip tube actually goes inside the exhaust manifold and it's clear. But on the earlier years, it actually hangs out sideways and when you lower the car down, you bend the dipstick. Mark always accuses me of being the great dipstick uh, destroyer. Hard to soar with eagles when you're flying with turkeys. That was the old saying. So anyway, I guess this is something Mark should have known and he could have you know, alerted me to that, but he likes to blame me for everything, so. How we looking, gentlemen? Snug. Good. Oh, man. Watch that. Okay. Any room to go to the passenger I... side at all? Yeah. Oh, nope, too much. Wait, Hold it. stop. This beautiful, 1970 Dodge Charger RT 426 Hemi four-speed is one of only 56 ever made, and we restored it back in season five. The question is, what is the sales code for the legendary 426 Hemi? Is it E87, E74, E86? If you think you know the answer, bet all your money on it, watch the break, Come on back, I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how did we do on that one? The question was, what is the sales code for that beautiful 426 Hemi, which was a numbers matching one in our 70 Charger RT? Was it E87, E74, E86? If you said E74, you guessed it absolutely right. That was the sales code, by the way, for several years for the 426 Hemi. The E87 was available in the 70 Dodge Charger RT. That stood for 446 pack. And the E86 was standard in the 70 Dodge Charger RT, which was a 375 horsepower 440 Magnum. This little beauty also was a four speed D21 and just happened to be the car featured in the greatest reveal in graveyard cars history. What? Are you ready to go down more? Yeah, very slowly, please. Can't understand mumble. Not, never will. Got to hear it. <laughs> very, very slowly, please. Carefully. I will go carefully. Carefully. Here we go. Fully care. Careful. How's the dip tube looking? Stop. OK. See, there's a fuel line getting close here, so slide that over there. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can uh, actually come down a little bit, Mark. Good. I never had it so easy. <laughs> nice, isn't it? It's so nice. Mark's perfected this system. Everything just slides right in, barely. Okay, I'm started. Okay. Um, Go ahead and raise it up. Okay. Raise the car just, up a hair. Just, just yeah. like an inch or two. It's got to go this way like an inch. We're so sophisticated now with our equipment and our process. It, it really isn't very challenging. You're always going to have alignment problems. You're going to have things that looks perfect when you're looking at it from five feet away, but as it comes down, you got to shift the transmission to the left or to the right to get the right alignment. Let me see if I can pull. Okay. Some of them go easier than others. Ow. Nothing goes perfectly smoothly. As typical, it fought us pretty good here, you know? We had to kind of pry things around a little bit. But even no matter how many of you do, if the geometry at the front of the engine is out of alignment by like an eighth of an inch, nope. okay, let it could her be down. an inch, maybe an sure. inch down and a half a at the back. That all just goes with the territory. But you're not laying upside down on a carport like Royal and I did when we were kids trying to stuff a transmission in something where the car's jacked up on pool balls. <laughs> you know, it, it, this is really good quality equipment. I usually do this myself. Goes yeah. quicker. What, part. Royal, what'd you say? I just tell everybody what a superb job you're doing. What? I need to tighten the team members. Yeah, go ahead and run those down and okay. I'll raise it up. And then Royal likes working down on the ground like that. That much closer to laying down and taking a nap, isn't it, buddy? Not here. You wouldn't take a nap under there? No. 
This is the third lie Royals told, so he's out. Okay, if this is boxing, he's done. I've been with Royal my whole life. I know he'd take a nap under there. We went to Vegas the first year to Seaman. Oh. Takes me two hours and two bottles of NyQuil to fall asleep. Royal walks in the room and falls completely asleep before he even gets to bed, and then just sleepwalks the rest of the way into bed. When we were kids growing up, he would fall asleep all the time. I thought he had narcolepsy. So if we were out there playing pool in the carport, because I had a pool table, and he would sit down in one of the lawn chairs, literally from the time that I said eight ball corner pocket, and I looked over, he was out. I have never been able to sleep like that. You can't tell me you can't take a nap under there. I didn't say I couldn't. I just said I was would. OK. So have you ever seen Royal sleeping somewhere strange to corroborate Mark's accusations against you? Other than the back seat of his mother's 64 Chrysler down by the river. <laughs> Can I use that? You ready, Doug A? Yes, sir. Going up. I'm ready. Did you undo the belt? What belt? The strap? This belt? God, you're my friend. Compared to when we were kids, uh, this is just the same. We had a good time then, and we're having a good time now. OK. Now I'm ready. So Dougie gets nervous when the cameras are on. He'll repeat himself two or three times in the same sentence or, or with back-to-back -back sentences. Yeah, we, we had a good time then, and we're having a good time now. Mark's accusing me of being a little camera shy. Well, uh, I guess that is kind of true, you know. Uh, I guess because they're always looking at me. Okay, so we have the engine and transmission bolted into place. Now we're going to put the front suspension up into the uh, upper control arms, put the torsion bars in it, then we can put the front wheels on it and let it down on the ground. It'll be a roller. Once it's a roller, it can go over and have the vinyl top and the headliner put in over its stands. So that's what we do. The drivetrain install and the 69 Charger went pretty well. Went together pretty good, and that makes some adjustments, but uh, no real big problems. It's way easier putting the drivetrains in this way. Working with Royal was great. It's so good to have Royal back again, you know, and uh, we can kind of reminisce and, you know, work together. It's really fun. But for me, the best part of doing an operation like this is just being able to work with my friends that I grew up with. Getting to work together at this age and still working on cars, still playing with cars, you know, just like we were kids. So it's like us three guys hanging out in my carport with much better equipment. We're looking forward to uh, finishing this up, rolling it out, and uh, working together some more. Now that we have the decals installed on the Daytona, we're able to put the wing on it. This is a cast aluminum piece. Uh, yesterday we were talking about how much it might weigh, so I got the scale out to see who might be right. You guessed 75? 55. You said 75. Uh, Why would you? You better not. <laughs> yeah, I know what you did, didn't you? No. He's so scared to look bad on TV, he probably went home and Googled it. I switched my guess on us uh, weighing the Daytona wing. You know, I had some time to, you know, ask my dad, but uh, Mark taught me. No, that's what I did. That's like a punch right in the ear. Okay. Well, my answer <laughs> is the same it as it, it always was. I said 75. 60, 60, I think I said 65? Yeah. 65 and no, 75. No, you said 60. Okay, 60 and 75. There's the weight. One closest without going over gets the grand prize, which is nothing. So I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah. You get to keep your job. Well. That's the good news. I just want to see the wing on the car, so. Okay, so basically, we just want to see the wing on the car. We're going to weigh it real quick, and then we're going to install it on the car. We're going to put a 60-pound wing on. Or 75? Yeah. All right. More like do. 50 or 30. Yeah. What's that in your nose? I don't know. Nose ring? Why would you do that? I Nobody don't know. does that. Have eight, you not been watching Cobra 18. Kai? Johnny would let show. that happen. Johnny would question that and he would question the music he'll listen to. So I'm glad Mark is actually referencing TV shows or movies that I actually know. In this case, it was Cobra Kai. Since I'm a fan of it, I can actually relate to it and actually talk about it. Cobra Kai, no fear. Okay. Let's turn this on and zero it out. Okay. Pick up that end. Okay, get your calculator. 14.13. Okay. Back over here.
Wow, almost the same, 14.9. Well, I can tell I'm already way over. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one would be, should be 14.92, unless old Spray It Again Sam Will happen to paint it three times because of his runs. I call him Spray It Again Sam. 14.6. So that one has a little more paint on it than this one, or the casting's different. Okay. All right, you ready? Total. 45 or something. 43. 43. Wow. And we both get to keep our jobs. That's way lighter. 43 pounds setting on top 43. of three. I was surprised by the actual weight of the wing. No, I always thought they were a little bit heavier. Mopar did it good, and it weighs a lot less. So the reason that there are big braces and brackets underneath there is because this thing weighs 43 pounds, and that's just its natural weight. Okay, now, just for the record, for anybody who's actually weighed these wings before, that was what our wing weighed, all three pieces. Keep in mind a few things. We make all of our exterior panels way prettier than the factory ever did. In our case, we did filler work over everything so it would be smooth. Then we did primer, then we did paint. So all of that weighs a little bit. Also, our weigh-in didn't have the two bolts, the horizontal bolts that hold the wing to the vertical supports. But all of that total up wouldn't probably make a pound's worth of difference overall on it. But it gives you an idea of exactly what they weighed back in the day, and that's how much was setting on the top of those quarter panels before you even started working on the car. Beautiful. Love it when things line up like that. Awesome. That's such a, such a cool little gasket. Oh, yeah. Just flat, too. No ribs, no raises. Yeah. Nothing, just a... Interesting. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So I'll let you take the front. And I'll get down here to eye level. Come on in. I don't want to touch that vinyl till we're lined up perfectly. Okay. So tell me how you're looking. I'm pretty lined up with these holes up front. You want to come down just a little bit? A little bit. Kind of rest it on the vinyl. Okay. And with that, I think we can go ahead and plunk it down. What do you say? Yeah, let's try it. So what we see on the outside of a Daytona Charger going down the road is that big, beautiful wing in the car, of course. Wow. Sweet. Nice. Through All the right, wing washer and everything, huh? Let me get a nut on there. But there is inner structure that supports that wing. You cannot bolt a wing like that on the top of a quarter and have it not destroy the quarter panels. It would be too heavy. It would start to put dents in it. Every time you go over a bump, it would just drive the tops of the quarters down. Went through the wing washer and everything Beautiful. nice. Went right through the wing washer, Man. ready to go, yep. It's great. We'll tighten them down once we get the, yeah. the horizontal one on. All right, Awesome. let's do the other side. Okay, same thing on this side applies. Put your gasket. Very nice, I like it. Well, a, little, a little different, but okay. very close. I can view the front part and I'm gonna come to the back here. Okay, so I'm getting close here. How you, how's everything looking like it's lining up to you good? I'm lined up pretty good right now. If you scrape that decal, you're done. You gotta start all over. So it was pretty risky, but we were able to get it. So I think we've got it. So if you feel good about that, let's drop it. Here we go. Beautiful. Imagine if you were doing 200 miles an hour at NASCAR with the wind pushing it down. It would just flatten the quarters. Right there. Right there? Yep. And Good. we're in? We're in. Okay, I'll get a nut on there. So inside, there are inner structure pieces. There are brackets that go from the floor up to the wing washer. The wing washer is a large, it's just that, it's a washer. They call it a washer but it's a large, almost looks like a battery tray that covers the whole bottom footprint of where that spoiler comes in and gives it the support from front to back. So let's set it up there. You got your bolt? Yep, great. Okay. Right there. You know, watching the cars come together is always fun. I think it's a little bit wilder when you got a car so insane like that. 69 Charger Daytona with all the graphics and spoiler in the nose cone. I got mine started, here you go. This one just reminds me completely of Tom Partridge's car. So Tom had, he was the pain in the ass that was out here in season three that tortured me all the time. Looked like a great big stub toe walking around because he's bald. I love you, Tom. I hope you're doing good back there, brother. 
Anyway. Tom's car was a real barn find, but it was nowhere near as original as nice as this one. We had a lot of work to do on that car. That car got everything. It was in dire straits. But when it was done and driving down the road, it looked as beautiful as this car. And absolutely, at the end of the day, these cars will stop traffic. It's starting to look like a Daytona. That looks beautiful. So we'll go ahead. It looks like everything is real square. Fits nice. Yeah, side nice. to side and everything. Vertical. It's great. So at this point, I'll go ahead and let you start tightening from the bottom up. Just okay. start with the lowest brackets and work your way up. The only thing is, before you tighten the bracket, the support bracket to the floor, get the wing washer to the spoiler tight. Okay. So it doesn't try to draw that quarter panel down. Oh, yeah. So we're done with the spoiler on the Daytona, and now he can go ahead and get the wing washer bolted into place tightly against the actual spoiler itself. Then he can tighten the bottoms down. Then he can adjust the top. I'd say we just run it at a You just want to run flat. it level? Yep, okay. run it level. I will leave it in his capable hands to get it all tightened down. He'll call me back, I'll do a sign off on it, and then we're ready to move to the front. I am really looking forward to putting the nose cone on for the simple fact that when that's done, the car's almost done, but it actually looks like a Daytona for the first time now in many, many years. So, but with that, I'm gonna go pick on somebody else. Okay. I got other people to pick on. Have fun. Kentucky! So with the car being in the booth, I like to let that sit for like an hour or two, fully gas out, let all the vapors, just everything just breathe a little bit. Then at that point, I'll go back in the booth, double check the car, then it's time to clear it. The gentleman that owns the car has been very patient with us. He's grown with us, as most of our folks have. You know, when we moved in, I was taking everything on I could at once because I wanted to make sure we had a full shop and I had anticipated that we'd do 24 cars a year. Well, that was a little lofty. In this particular case, the guy has been wonderful. He's worked with us. And it's going to be a real pleasure for me to hand him back the set of keys that he handed me. He specifically put those in my hand. So when the car's done, I'm going to hand them back in his hand and he's going to head down the highway. This was a nice car to clear because it's a small car. Most of these Mopars, man, they're like every bit over 20 feet long. Then you put the hoods in there and deck lids are huge. This is just a little itty bitty A-body. By the time I get one coat around the car, double check, everything looks great. I can go mix up another coat. And this whole process on this car really went easy. The car looks great. It's always exciting to do a different car. I'm not a fan of this particular car, but I'm noticing as the car's coming further along, it's kind of grown on me and I'm super excited. Just to see the way it comes out, V5 blue, gorgeous color. We've done three or four cars in a row this color, so eh. But the car itself, it's the first time we've done a 69. It's an A body, it came out gorgeous. Took a couple days to get it because it's one of those colors, if there's the slightest imperfection, you can see it. So you just kinda take your time, go through the process, double check everything. Got most of the color wrapped up on a Friday. Came in Saturday morning with the uh, camera guy. Oh, he's not camera guy anymore, producer. And then him and I, oh, sorry. Cut? <laughs> we'll cut it. So now that we've reached the final stages of the assembly process of the 1970 Cuda, now I can put the information labels on and do all the assembly line markings on the bottom of the car. So the assembly line markings, basically what happened was as that car went down the assembly line and somebody would perform an operation on it, such as tightening down the shock absorbers. One swatch of paint represents that it's the correct shock. The other swipe of paint represents that it's in the right place. You see the same thing on leaf springs, the leaf spring hangers, the rear axle assembly, drive shafts got marked. If somebody put the U-joints in it, they made a mark that the U-joints were done. Transmission cross member, same thing. They want to make sure that somebody down the line knows all of these items have been torqued. Front suspension, there's a lot of components up there. Inner and outer tie rod ends, ball joints, upper and lower, idler arm, pitman arm, all of those have to signal the person next on the assembly line that it's been addressed. There's all kinds of different colors. Each one represents something. We do our very best to mimic the originals when we don't have photographs. So we used the Dave Weiss book for references to make sure that we got all the assembly line markings in the correct spot. We go through that thing page after page, looking for previously documented components to make sure 
that we're doing the best we can to emulate the original assembly line look. You know, it's interesting on this tape now, I don't exactly know what it represented, but we've seen it before. The piece of three quarter inch masking tape on both sides of the axle housing, we've seen it on Dana's. We've never seen it on the eight and three quarter. Additionally, the Dana axle got a paper label that called out the full part number. Another interesting detail point. Another interesting point of detail is both eight and three quarter and Dana rearings got the last three digits of the assembly number stamped onto the housing. You'll find this assembly number over on your broadcast sheet. Hello, ghouls. Back in season 10, episode 13, we completed the restoration of the Little Dead Wagon. True or false, the engine we went with was a Ray Barton supercharged 440 Magnum. If you think you know that answer and you've been paying attention to the show, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. Once I have either myself or my helper do the cut and buff on the car, take it outside, give it a good bath with steam, get the whole car thoroughly washed, underside everything, brought back in the booth, run another bake cycle on it so it dries that water quicker. Then we mask it up for the undercoating. Some cars get it, some don't get it. Most of them do. This car is a very clean car. The floor pans, every part and piece that was put on it looks great. We're not trying to cover anything up. You can look underneath that car and say, wow, look at that spot weld, look at that weld. Everything looks really good on it. So with the car being masked up, I go ahead and start the undercoat process, do a good once over on it, do the undercoating, make sure the proper thickness is there. Then after the undercoating is complete, unmask it. I like to let it sit in the booth overnight, and then I take it over to the assembly side, and at that point, we're officially done with the car. The last points of detailing beside the assembly line markings on these cars are the information labels. Now, we get these from ECS. They're the ones that provide it for, actually, even the manufacturers today go to ECS to get replacement door vehicle identification labels and such because they are authorized by all the manufacturers to make them. We get the information labels not only for the door vehicle identification number, but for all of the items underneath the hood, the ethylene glycol warning label, the engine emission, the small detail tags that have the part numbers on them for the exhaust, the parking brake cables, the wiring harnesses, the kit that we get also comes with things like a replica of the original warranty card, the sleeve that goes over the visor for locking instructions should that apply, the how to start it little tag that goes on the turn signal, all kinds of neat stuff that really when you're done with the car and all the assembly line markings are on, all the information labels are on, and the rest of the car is done like it should be done, it looks like it rolled off the assembly line. And that's what our car looks like. It just rolled off the assembly line. The information labels from ECS and the assembly line markings are all done on our 1970 CUDA, and this is one more car that is out of the graveyard and ready for a customer. All right, everybody, welcome back, and how did you do on that one? I gave you an easy one. Lately, they haven't been all that easy. I think this one was pretty easy. Was the engine we put in the Little Dead Wagon a supercharged 440 Magnum? No, the answer's false. You ain't been watching the show. It was a 426 Hemi Mopar block that we bought directly from Mopar, sent it to Ray Barton. He built it up where it would put out almost a thousand horsepower. It featured an 871 blower shop supercharger with dual Holley carburetors, hand-built Zumi headers, Moon Eyes tanks, custom seats from the original seats the truck started life with, stainless steel bed trim, and 33-inch tubs. All right, here we go. Maiden voyage. All right, so let's see what we got. Right now, it feels good, doing about 25 miles an hour. Second gear feels nice. Our test drive on the 70 Cuda is a blast. This car runs so good. The cam is so obnoxious. It just feels strong when you're setting in it. Got a good feel to the road. 
it's running BF Goodrich TA radials on it. Well, that's an old standby, great tire, looks great, very nostalgic looking. We're running those on a Krager SS rim. So just a, you know, very old school, second day, they call it. Now, when you take all that horsepower, that 390 horsepower under the hood, and you see that big bad boy shaker, you're backing it up with that six-speed Silver Sport transmission, you can row through the gears like butter. This truly is one of the funnest little cars I've driven. Boy, that Silver Sport transmission's tight, really tight. It is the first time we have put a six-speed Silver Sport transmission behind a regular Mopar engine. In the past, we've done it behind the Hell Crate, we've done it behind the 392 Crate, but we've never put it behind a 446 barrel. Got a hydraulic clutch because of the Silver Sport transmission using that Tremec six-speed. So it's not the old conventional clutch, feels a little different. Feels solid, but pushes a little different, easier than the old three-finger style or the diaphragm center forces that we use. So for me to drive this car around, it just feels great. It has so much old school feel to it because of the engine, but it has that new school slickness to it. That pulls you right back. See, there's no making up for torque. I guarantee it. I've got an 800 horsepower a Hellcat Red Eye, but it doesn't have the torque that this thing has. This is brute, old-fashioned, American, brain-pounding, blunt force trauma torque. Feel that? Feel that, Nancy? That's real. I'll tell you what, you would not know the difference between this car and a real live V-code car. It runs like it, drives like it, looks like it. Other than the vehicle identification number, this is a 446 barrel car. It runs and drives beautiful. The way that it handles the road, even though we're talking about 50 year old technology, these cars handled well. This one handles well. So the steering is nice and tight. Uh, we have all of our steering gears rebuilt. We put a, uh, we call a stage two kit in them. It makes them a little more rigid, less, less easy to turn, more, more resistance to them. Feel that? See that shaker come all the way up? That shaker just walks all the way up. That is cool. Boy, that feels good. That's third gear right there, and that is nice. Car holds the road like it's on rails. Beautiful. Love it. You know, when you see the car going down the road, it's beautiful. It's FJ5, it's got the hockey stick on, it's got the rear spoiler, shaker hood. To me, the Krager five spokes just set it off. The BF Gooders just set it off. Because those are what we had when we were kids. Well, I didn't. Dougie did. Dougie's daddy made sure that he had all the best of everything. He had the five spokes, he had the BF Goodrich. I had an old truck tire on the right rear of my car, something I found in mom's trunk of her Impala on the left rear, and then two white Mojocks on the front of it. I had nothing. I had a dead dad, a tumor in my foot, a terrible case of Osgood slaughter, you know, and, and a big nose. See the shadow on the wall? It's like that groundhog that comes out and says it's okay, everything gonna be okay. You see my shadow, you know everything gonna be okay. 